Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today, both in person and those watching live on the internet. My name's John McNee, and I'm the Secretary General of the Global Center for Pluralism. I'm delighted on behalf of my colleagues to welcome you all to our new international headquarters. This is, I think, only our second public event, so you're very special to us. Um, for what promises to be an extremely timely discussion of the links between diversity, pluralism, economic and economic prosperity in Canada. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that this event is taking place on the traditional territory of the Algonquin nations. This heritage building, once the home to the Canadian War Museum, and before that, the Dominion Archives of Canada, has been transformed by a major investment of His Highness the Aga Khan into a global hub for research, learning, and dialogue about the values, policies, and practices that advance respect for diversity, both in Canada and globally. Nous sommes très heureux d'organiser l'événement d'aujourd'hui en partenariat avec la Fondation Pierre-Élyse Trudeau et avec l'important soutien du Centre pour l'innovation dans la gouvernance internationale. And it's a very great pleasure to be collaborating with my old friend, Morris Rosenberg, president of the Trudeau Foundation, and all of his colleagues. Dans la dernière année, la Fondation a appuyé une équipe de recherche dirigée par Besma Momani et Jillian Sturck. Dans le cadre de la recherche, Besma et Jill ont voyagé d'un bout à l'autre du Canada pour rencontrer d'importants employeurs canadiens des groupes d'entreprises, des organisations de la société civile, des agences gouvernementales et des universitaires. Leur objectif était d'explorer l'impact de la diversité sur le rendement économique des industries et des entreprises canadiennes et, par extension, sur les liens entre la diversité et la prospérité économique et la manière dont les Canadiens contribuent et profitent des connexions mondiales qui caractérisent les économies fortes et dynamiques du XXIe siècle. L'événement d'aujourd'hui marque le lancement public officiel de leur rapport final intitulé « Les fruits de la diversité, l'avantage mondial du Canada ». And I think you've all found copies of the report on your chair, and the digital version is on the GCP website, and on the CG site. The event is being webcast on our website and Facebook. The panel will be accepting questions from the online audience, and we encourage those watching to tweet in their questions using the hashtag DiversityDividend. The Global Center for Pluralism has been pleased to have been able to help the research team during their data collection efforts by hosting a roundtable with business and government representatives in Ottawa last summer. Too often, questions of diversity are examined through overly narrow lenses, with artificial silos created among the social, political, and economic spheres of society. This research project, designed and led by Besma and Jill, has, from the very start, sought to bridge the gaps between economic and governance questions and to draw links with wider societal issues at play in Canada. Diversity is a fact, but pluralism is a choice. The Global Center for Pluralism defines pluralism as a positive response to diversity in society, which serves to promote and increase inclusion for all. Strong and sustainable economies are also inclusive economies that maximize the ability of all peoples to access, contribute to, and benefit from participation in economic life. And so the research such as that being showcased today is helping to highlight the positive effects that greater inclusion brings, not simply for individuals or communities, but for societies. Our very distinguished panel, we'll hear, for in a, hear from in a moment, includes representatives from the private sector, civil society, academia, and the media. And before moving to the panel, I would first like to give, to the, floor, give the floor to the leaders of the project. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Besma Momani, senior fellow at the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation, uh, a fellow at CG, and professor of political science at the University of Waterloo, and Jill Sturck, former Canadian ambassador to Norway, and now an associate with the Simon Fraser Center for Dialogue and a mentor at the Trudeau Foundation. Bestman Jill, welcome. Yeah. 
Thank you all for being here. Thank you to John and his wonderful staff here at GCP for all they've done to put this event together. We really appreciate it and thank you all for attending. I guess uh, we've started a conversation um, and hopefully this will be just one of, of many conversations that many have about our society. And, and you had this great question that you, or this great um, um, talk about what pluralism means and how the Global Center for Pluralism envisions this. And we've one of the things I think that we've seen in our, our talking to business leaders across Canada, uh, our, our exploration of the academic literature, is that really there's a plenty of terms out there to talk about what we're talking on. And whether we're looking at terms like diversity, inclusion, and pluralism, they often conjure different images. And diversity is a fact. I mean, diversity is in this room. Diversity is in all of our major cities. Diversity is something that I think we can visually see. Inclusion is something very different. And I dare say we're not there yet on inclusion. And while pluralism is something to the effect of institutionalizing the best practices of diversity and inclusion, they are also aspirational. And so if it's our government talking about the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and legislating the good things about diversity and inclusion into the very fabric of our institutions, that doesn't mean that we're doing a great job on inclusion. And so while this report hopefully is meant to motivate um, all of us to think about diversity, I hope that the conversation still continues on what inclusion is and what it should be if we're going to you know, create this ideal society that is Canada and that is representative of all of us here. On that front, before I give you a little more about the study itself and, and move on to this great panel, I'm just going to cue and ask uh, for those who are in charge of the video to just put up this lovely video that takes about two minutes and gives you a little bit about uh, what we did and um, hopefully entertain you a little. With immigrants from more than 200 countries, Canada provides the business model for global connectivity. 20.6% of Canadians are foreign-born, and 25% of Canadians speak a non-official language. A diversity dividend could be Canada's global comparative advantage. To show how, we explored the link between diversity and economic prosperity. Statistical analysis revealed significant positive relationships between ethnocultural diversity and prosperity. A 1% increase in a workplace's ethnocultural diversity was associated with an average 2.4% increase in revenue and 0.5% in productivity. This effect was strongest in creative, innovative, and professional services. Overall, 13 out of 14 industries we assessed stood to benefit from greater ethnocultural diversity. Over 100 Canadian business executives we consulted confirmed that diversity is profitable. But why? Diversity provides access to a wider talent pool. Increased innovation and creativity allows companies to better tailor their services to diverse customers and improves understanding of international opportunities and markets abroad. Business benefits are just one element of the diversity dividend which lead to greater social cohesion. Canadians should work to build an inclusive society and addressing barriers, fears, and discriminatory practices will help unlock and maximize the diversity dividend. And so one of the things that the diversity dividend was able to tell us is that companies that are able to have a diverse workforce see not only as, as the video showed, increase in their bottom line, but increased productivity as well. And one of the things that we wanted to tease out in our research is not just the, you know, talking about the rhetoric of the diversity dividend, because I think we've all heard that before, and many companies have acknowledged and if not even internalized that, but we wanted to get to the bottom line of saying that this can be good for businesses in terms of their revenue. And one of the things that I think we saw uh, from our research was that it did, it did help many of those creative sectors where there's innovation, where there's uh, an opportunity to be more innovative, but we were pleasantly surprised to see it also uh, be beneficial in the manufacturing sector. And I think this is really important because it really, I think, points to a new amount or new um, uh, push in research that I think can be done about exploring what it is 
that, um, uh, that makes this uh, such an interesting driver. Our methods, as noted, was a statistical one. We were able to meet with 8,000, or I should say we uh, were able to assess the data of 8,000 workplaces, over 150,000 workers. And very interesting, we were able to apply a statistical method using an algorithm that isolated diversity as being the key and only factor that explained the surge in revenue. And so it was a very robust finding. And then we had a chance to talk to business leaders. And this was where the exciting part happened because we heard from those who are on the front lines of hiring across this country about why it is that diversity is good for business. Okay, thank you, Besma. Um, as Besma mentioned, we uh, conducted a number of consultations across the country, seven major cities. Um, and again, I heard some, I think some common themes emerged from those the discussions. Uh, first of all, um, all of the, the companies are looking to expand their talent pool, and they know they need to reach uh, beyond uh, you know, traditional, uh, traditional hiring practices, if you like. Um, as Besma already mentioned, um, this concept of hiring the market to, to serve the market, uh, to better reflect the, the demographics of the, of the customer base, and to understand uh, the customer base so that they can tailor uh, products and services. Um, it's clear that there's also, uh, with diversity, comes creativity uh, and innovation, um, different ideas uh, competing, and uh, new concepts uh, emerging, so very important in terms of, uh, of productivity. Uh, and then last of all, of course, being able to reach out to, to global markets, that kind of global connectivity that comes uh, with the knowledge and understanding of, of different cultures. Sometimes people call that a kind of cultural fluency. Um, and given Canada's demographics, it's something we ought to be better at than, than almost anyone else uh, around the world. But business has also told us that uh, despite the fact that they all see the benefits of diversity, they know they need to do more, they know they need to do better, and that their companies don't fully reflect uh, the Canadian demographic picture. So they talked about barriers, barriers to inclusion, um, and uh, around hiring, um, often difficulty recognizing uh, foreign education, foreign experience, uh, credentials, uh, unconscious bias in hiring practices, um, and then, uh, indeed, um, once uh, employees are in a firm, uh, maybe there are barriers there that prevent uh, them from moving forward in the organization. Or, indeed, you have a, a kind of a factor at play where uh, those kinds of differences are, are sort of homogenized. And so, although you hire people to bring those different perspectives once they're within an organization, it becomes hard to, to express a different point of view. So we took all this away and um, came up with a series of recommendations. And, and although I would say some of those recommendations are not new, I think there's a new urgency around them, uh, given what we see happening uh, in our neighbor to the south and, uh, and in Europe, and just how important inclusion is. Um, first of all, the importance of unlocking talent. Um, and uh, this is all of the, the issues around inclusive hiring. We hear uh, talking about uh, perhaps the value of blind recruitment, uh, where you, you don't uh, know what the ethnic origin might be of, of your applicants. That's one tool. Um, more diverse uh, boards in terms of, uh, of hiring uh, so that they can better appreciate uh, that international uh, experience. Um, of course, the whole question around credentials um, has been, uh, I think, uh, an, an issue for a long time. Uh, but again, there's a new urgency because the underemployment, uh, especially of, uh, of new immigrants, is, is it's kind of like a stranded resource, if you like. Um, so we have very talented people here, but no way uh, for them to actually enter uh, the economy at a level where they can contribute commensurate with their, their skills and experience. Um, second kind of basket of issues was more around, I would say, policy questions. Um, the, the importance of being able to measure diversity, to understand what your organization looks like. And that operates both on a, on a firm level, um, but also on the broader level. Uh, government stopped collecting the statistical data that we used in 2006. Um, and we all know that with the kinds of changes we've seen uh, in the economy and uh, in Canada's demographics in the last 10 years, um, we think there are some very interesting uh, issues that we could explore if we were to collect that data uh, again. Uh, procurement policies, um, another way of driving innovation uh, is for firms to uh, factor uh, diversity into you know, their procurement processes as one factor to be uh, assessed. 
Uh, it's also a way of bringing in smaller firms, um, where, which in Canada often are more diverse. There's, a, I think, a very strong record of entrepreneurship um, among uh, new uh, recent immigrants to Canada. And um, by building that into the procurement process, I think would, would be another way of addressing uh, that. Um, and then, of course, uh, the whole question of um, indicators and, and benchmarks. Uh, I think we've uh, very much stayed away from uh, any suggestion of, of quotas, but uh, there are uh, kinds of benchmarks that firms can use to, to kind of examine them, their own record and see how well they're doing in terms of diverse hiring, diverse promotion, recognizing uh, diverse views. And this is a way for uh, clients and for shareholders to actually hold uh, firms uh, accountable for their, for their performance. Uh, and last of all, uh, I would say the importance of connecting to the world. Uh, for businesses tell us they value that international experience, but they're also the first to admit uh, that when it comes to hiring, uh, they don't always um, uh, recognize that in a, in a tangible way. Um, encouraging young Canadians to go abroad and get uh, that experience and, and to bring it back. And last of all, we think um, without you know, being preachy uh, that Canada does have a message to take uh, to the world um, around the model um, of diversity and, uh, and inclusion. Uh, host of the, the G7 summit coming up in 2018. That could be uh, an interesting opportunity for the government to talk about uh, how, uh, in, about the diversity dividend, if you like, and how um, diversity is in fact good for business. Um, and last of all, I would just like to say that I think we're really quite at a critical uh, juncture uh, here in Canada. Um, we're often maybe a little complacent. We think we're doing pretty well because we uh, look to our neighbors uh, to the south. We see what's happening in, in Europe. Um, but in fact, uh, I think there are some real untapped opportunities here. Uh, and uh, there are also, um, I think, some, some very divisive uh, attitudes there. And um, there is an opportunity for us to try to, to tackle those and, and demonstrate how diversity is actually good for everyone. And so I think maybe I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. We'll turn to Omar. Thank you, both of you. I had a chance to go through the report, and I think you've done a great job, not because of the, the larger philosophical discussions behind diversity, but also because there are real practical implications. We know that and there is a diversity a dividend. I think, Jill, you touched on something very important, and that is that there is definitely a renewed urgency to having this, this conversation. And we would be remiss not to uh, at least touch on what happened in France last night, which was uh, extremely significant and truly historic. Why? Because not since World War II has an anti-immigrant far-right leader come this close to taking power in France. Of course, we'll know the, the final conclusion on May 7th, uh, if Marine Le Pen is in fact victorious or not. But this shows us uh, significantly that the winds of protectionism and populism are still blowing strong, which, which of course gives this uh, discussion more urgency and makes it especially timely. We have to arm ourselves with facts and information, not with the type of political rhetoric that we have uh, seen in recent months and years. In this country, I think uh, there is, of course, lots to celebrate. I saw a story today that showed that UNHCR said that in 2016, uh, Canada took in more refugees, uh, for the largest number of refugees in a single year uh, when you compare it to the past four decades. So there is lots to celebrate in this country, but we can't just pat ourselves on, on the back either. There are some fundamental gaps, and that's why we are here to have frank discussions about identifying those gaps. I've got three super smart people next to me who've got all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. So I just briefly like to introduce everybody. Paul Davidson is, of course, the president and the CEO of Universities Canada since 2009. Uh, he's known for making Canadian campuses more international and increasing access for Aboriginal students. Prior to his role, uh, he was the executive director of World University Service Canada and held senior positions in Canadian book publishing and also served as a political advisor to Ontario's leader of the opposition, treasurer, and <coughs> premier. We've also got beside him uh, Kamal al Suleili. He's the author of the national best selling memoir, Mark. Intolerable, a memoir of extremes. And that book won the 2013 Toronto Book Award and was a finalist for Canada Reads and the Hillary Weston Writer Trust Prize for Nonfiction. His latest book, Brown, 
was nominated for the Governor General Literary Awards in nonfiction and the Shaughnessy Cohen Prize for political writing. Previously, a theater critic at the Globe and Mail, he's written for uh, all of the major publications, major publications in Canada, and is associate professor of journalism at Ryerson University in Toronto. And last but not least, uh, Sabine Hergy, who's uh, sitting right beside me here, Chief Human Resources Officer at RBC, which of course is Canada's, Canada's largest bank. Uh, she also serves on the Governing Council of the University of Toronto, chairs Toronto Region Immigrant, Immigrant Employment Council, and director of Toronto Civic Action, where she chairs Escalator Jobs for Youth Facing Bar Barriers. She's received Canada's Meritorious Service Medal for Advancing Diversity and Inclusion, Outstanding Alumni Award from the Simon Fraser University, been included in Canada's Most Powerful Women, the Top 100 Hall of Fame, and Top 25 Women of Influence. I'm running out of breath. <laughs> uh, so let, let's start with, with this distinction between pluralism and diversity, which I think Best and uh, Jill set out very clearly in their opening remarks. And I just want to take it sector by sector. Um, perhaps Paul, we can start with you. Page 15 of the report says, points to a 2006 census and says that 17% of university teachers belong to a visible mi a minority group. And the issue is not uh, a pipeline issue. Uh, so if it's not that, what is it? And how are universities across this country doing vis-a-vis -vis diversity, but also vis-a-vis -vis pluralism? Thanks. It's great to be with you tonight. It's great to see the Global Center performing its role here and uh, really welcome the question because the issues of diversity and inclusion are a priority for Canada's universities. If you think about it, there are a million students pursuing their undergraduate degree in Canada right now. The experiences they have will drive Canada's prosperity and shape the nature of our country for the next 50 years. And so we're concerned when we see numbers like that, that the, that the faculty and staff do not fully reflect the diversity of Canadian universities. One of the challenges that uh, Bessman and Jill pointed out is collecting data is really hard. Uh, StatsCan has stopped collecting the kind of information that would be most useful to take a systemic approach. But there are things that Canada's universities are doing to address that. Uh, some might be interested to know that all of Canada's universities presidents have been offered unconscious bias training as a way of getting the blinders off them in their approach to hiring. We're also uh, in a process of, of looking at inclusive excellence principles, which we hope we'll be able to make public later this year, uh, that set some very ambitious targets for Canadian universities to be more fully reflective of the diversity of the country. And are you finding that, I mean, because this stat is now about a decade old, are you, are you finding that there has been an increase from 2006? Yeah, there has been some progress, but the progress is uneven, and, and uh, we need to do more. And in terms of pluralism, I mean, what does that look like on Canadian campuses these days? Are we talking about, uh, you know, a, a different variety of, of course uh, offerings? What, what, what does it look like? Well, let me first of all invite everyone in this room to visit a Canadian campus. Because one of the challenges we have is people tend to remember their university experience when they were at university themselves. Universities are actually places of great dynamism, innovation, and responsiveness to community needs. And if you walk a Canadian campus now, you will see uh, Canadian diversity reflected. One of the things that I think we're most proud of as, as, uh, as a university community is our attraction of talent. In, in including uh, a tripling of the number of international students studying in Canada. That's a huge asset for Canada, and it means that all Canadian students then have an opportunity to, to embrace pluralism in the classroom. And are you finding that those international students are, are staying, or do they go back home? It's a bit of both. And again, uh, in my previous work, I was with World University Service of Canada, so brain drain is something I'm sensitive to. We tend to look now at, at issues of brain circulation, and how do we get uh, top talent around the world are working together on global problems. And uh, in, in that regard, and perhaps a little later we can chat about it because the report uh, cites it, our huge need to get Canadian students to have international experience. While the number of international students studying in Canada has tripled over the last 15 years, the number of Canadians studying abroad has not changed in 30 years. Here we think of ourselves as the most open, global, trading, pluralistic society in the world. And yet, Americans are more likely to study internationally. Germans are more likely to study internationally. Australians are more likely to study internationally. We're leaving opportunity on the table by having our Canadian stu students stay at home. And Kamal, you're, you're on the front lines, so right. to speak, in, in, in one of the most diverse uh, cities in Canada. Um, 
an interesting comment. There's a review done in the Globe and Mail on your book, Brown. Mm -hmm. And I think it was one of your former students. And she had actually said that in her experience of, of being at Ryerson, you were the only non-white professor she had, which is surprising in a city such as Toronto. Now there are two of us. Now there are two of us. <laughs> 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 yes. Uh, uh, right. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I want to pick up on, on what Paul just said uh, in terms of if you come and walk through a campus um, and certainly come and visit the School of Journalism. We have, we have an incredibly diverse um, student population. But what I'm finding is who gets the plum jobs has not changed. And who among the women, of, particularly women of color, who end, who end up doing reporting jobs for The Globe or for CTV, if, if I may say so, um, uh, has not changed. And there is, there is actually a bit of a problem between um, who is studying at university and then who, in, in particularly in the field that we work in, media, and who's getting the opportunity. I, I see a complete disconnect there. Desp you know, despite the fact that we are one of the most diverse campuses and we live in, a very, uh, you know, it's in the heart of a very progressive city, um, the hiring decisions have, have remained stuck um, in, an African, in an old demographic. So I, I, it sounds like what you're saying is that even, even though there might be more uh, writers from diverse backgrounds or more reporters from diverse backgrounds on television mm -hmm. in terms of the, the editorial component of it or the behind the scenes, there's still more there's work still, that needs to be done. Because it's not just about, um, um, like, let me just use the term metaphorically only, like foot soldiers. It is really about the generals and the decision makers. Um, it's, uh, I mean, uh, in, in our line of work in media, um, editors and producers are still the gatekeepers of this industry. They decide what stories are told, what stories get airtime, what stories, what op-eds make it to the, to, uh, the op-ed pages, what feature, I mean, so for, I'll give you one example. I, I, teach, um, I teach a course in magazine writing, and I have a very diverse, uh, obviously, student population. And I have not, until this year, I have not been able to find one magazine editor in Canada who, in Toronto at least, who is a visible minority in a senior position. Not one. I taught this course for eight years now. Finally, I found somebody from Chatelaine, and, from uh, Flair magazine, and I just grabbed her, and she's a former student. Um, and the same for the content. I, I, I've been looking for stories by African-Canadian um, and, and until 2015 when Desmond Cole published his story um, in Toronto Life, there was not one single story by an African Canadian in a Canadian, in a Canadian magazine. We're talking about Canada in 2016, you know, 15 and 16. There is still a huge gap between who gets to have a platform and who goes to university. So stories are essentially being killed before they can, they're, they're pitched and, and, and killed. Is that what you're saying? Well, ed I mean, editors have to have a kind of more than just skills at the job. They have to have imagination. They have to seek out stories. I mean, the, uh, let me just put it the other way. There are stories that are being told about diverse communities. They tend to be stories about um, um, honor killings or drug among the African uh, drug uh, among the African community, uh, African Canadian community. They, they are they are, we're always there to represent the the uh, the pitfalls of multiculturalism, and not and not this dividend that that you know Basman and Angel just. So so that's uh, I mean I would. I would love to, for example, to, to see a panel on, on television about issues that relate to, um, not, I'd like to see, for example, for, let's put it this way, whenever you, need, when you, whenever you think of an expert on issues like the environment or, or, uh, or governance or whatever, um, you, you, you always see the same face, the same demographic. But if it's an issue of multiculturalism, uh, Islamophobia, people like me and Besma are always kind of um, are asked to go on and talk about this. But we can talk about a lot of other issues as well. Mm. Zabin, you've shattered so many uh, glass ceilings in the world of corporate culture. Uh, and I'm wondering what you've observed. I, uh, we, we've noticed that there has been uh, more, you know, better hiring practices when it comes to hiring people from different backgrounds. But in terms of seeing you know, promotion within an organization to get to the higher echelons of an organization. Are you are you seeing an emphasis on that as well, or is there is that s slow to come? Great, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. And and um, I think really what uh, you know 
and what we're talking about here is inclusion. So if you, you need to de-average the numbers. You can't just look at overall workforce numbers uh, because in many ways organizations and certainly large organizations like mine that have generally good talent practices, the labor market really takes care of the, the, the people that are entering the organization. So our focus in terms of um, of the, um, the talent strategy is around advancement. Um, it's around when we, once we have the talent in our organization, what are the practices that we have in place? Um, what are we doing to spot talent earlier and to, to actually focus then on developing people um, to make sure that they've got um, not just mentorship, but that they've got sponsors. And mentors are people who talk with you, that help you with your career. Sponsors are people who talk about you. They promote your um, thanks. They, they really uh, talk about why this person should get that job, the talent that they see um, that they see in them. So really, it's very much, um, you know, we have 80,000 people and the jobs that we focus on, it's about 3,500 jobs that are at the senior level where we, in fact, have um, uh, goals in, in terms of new appointments and how many, what percentage uh, should be women and what percentage should be visible minorities. And sometimes, you know, when you talk about goals, people think quotas. Absolutely not. These are goals like we have for everything else that's important to our organization. We have business goals. We have goals to grow our various different businesses. And by the same token, we have goals around, uh, around representation and around appointments. And when you have those goals, you then have really good rigor around you know, we have, we have a practice where we say, bring your best woman candidate forward. Bring your best visible minority candidate forward. They may not be the person for the job at the time, but what that really forces you to do is to get to know them, to see what their strengths are, to see what their gaps are, to challenge others around sometimes the unconscious biases and sometimes conscious biases. Let's, let's, you know, let's be honest there, uh, to really to really push the discussion to be very objective. You know, for example, one of the things you often hear is, well, that person doesn't have executive presence. What does that mean? What does executive presence mean in this country in a global environment? That person's an executive somewhere to start with in some other country that is, you know, certainly very successful. And so then you need to push and say, well, Help me understand, because often executive presence means not like me, not somebody who speaks. And I'm not talking about an accent necessarily, but just a style. Um, somebody's stance might be different. And so through really driving those kinds of practices um, and really starting with the belief the business case is, is pretty strong. And as, as I've shared with some of you, it depends on the maturity of the organization. We don't really need to talk about the diversity dividend. It's pretty clear to us our client base is changing. The demographics of our, our clients um, is very different today than, uh, than it was 20, 30 years ago. And um, when you think about new immigrants coming into, um, in, into Canada, 250,000 to 300,000 plus international students, you add to that is another couple hundred thousand. Um, that's the growth in our labor market, but that's the growth in our client market as well. And so for us to, to serve the market, you need to hire the market. Is, it's pretty straightforward, um, the business case around that. I do want to pick up on your international student um, comment, Paul, um, because I, I think that is another um, under, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a resource and a talent base um, that's really underutilized. And, and collectively with universities and uh, with, with business and with government, I think we have tremendous opportunity there to really tap into, um, into that source. And, 
to give you an example of, uh, of uh, something that we started last year, it's a program that we call Amplify, and essentially we bring in, uh, we, we do, um, as summer students and uh, co-ops and interns, we do about 1,800 of those a year. Uh, but in this particular program, we, we brought in 32 students from many universities um, across the country. And we put them into teams of four and essentially let them go uh, and, and come up with um, ideas, help us solve problems in different ways. What was really interesting is about 50% of them were international students. Now, we didn't seek that out. We, we really, what we, what, we, what we were out looking for is people who weren't already like the people we have in the organization. People from different faculties, people with different experiences, with different life or work experiences. And this is where inclusion comes into play as well, though. We had to create the right conditions in the organization that weren't specifically about diversity, but they were about breaking down some of the hierarchy, the traditional ways of doing things, and to really have pro practices in place where we were drawing out the, the different ways of thinking, the different ideas, and actually addressing um, some of the, perhaps, the different ways in which people engage. Some, in some cultures, it's, there's a deference to hierarchy, and you need to actually draw people out. You need to explicitly um, include them. And, and coming out of that, we, we actually have two patents pending. Um, there were some really, really great, um, great innovations uh, that, that came out of that. And so when we talk about inclusion, it requires special actions, special measures, different behaviors to draw out the diversity because as we've heard, diversity is a fact. It's not, we don't need to debate that anymore. It's a fact in our country uh, and in many parts of the world. Uh, diversity doesn't really turn into you don't get the dividends, you don't leverage it unless you're able to draw out the best of everyone and when I stop to think about, you know, about um, this at a at a the level of Canada, 35 million, half are women. So you've got 17 plus visible minorities plus you know other LGBT people with disabilities. You add to that, and you're talking about 20 million people plus. Just think, if we can get the best out of all of our people, just just by a small fraction, that dividend is huge. And so in the end, it's really about our people. It's not just a discussion around diversity. It's a discussion around bringing the best out of every single person because that's what they want. That's their dreams. It's their aspirations. But it's a win for the individual. It's a win for the business. And it's a win for the prosperity of our nation. Diversity is certainly a fact, and, and inclusion is, is it's almost a verb. It's, it's an active uh, thing that you have to be doing on an ongoing basis. So how do you foster a sense of uh, inclusion in, in each of your respective sectors? How do you tell a student in a classroom who may be from another country and is uncomfortable about speaking in a group setting that, uh, that it's okay to do that or, or to get past some of these, uh, these, these cultural issues that he or she may have had in their, in their home countries? I'll just jump in there and, and to say that we do have a moment right now in Canada uh, to attract even more international students. The diversity dividend, the pluralism advantage is very real when students and their families are choosing where to study in the world. And I'll just say that in the last year since Brexit and since the events in the United States, we have seen a surge in international student applications. Students that would typically go to Britain, typically go to the United States are looking for alternatives but it's incumbent upon us to receive them well. Now they're choosing to come to Canada because of an outstanding higher education system, safe, secure, and welcoming. And that welcoming piece is very real. Uh, there are universities in Atlantic Canada where international students now make up 35% of the class. So the question of how you integrate 35% of, uh, of the students into the fuller student experience is, is a real concern, and it's a great opportunity for Canada. So in doing it well, we're, we're quick to say, look, we, there are economic benefits for Canada, but we can't see this as simply cash cows, if I'll be crass. Uh, it does require some language orientation, some cultural orientation, engagement in the community. Work-study work placements are a great way for international students to learn about Canadian culture and Canadian experience and for the business sector to learn more. 
And it's to come back to the economic message, in places like Atlantic Canada, where the demographic realities are hitting us faster, international students are a vital part of the whole prosperity for Atlantic Canada. And so I'm really pleased to see the government of Canada, the premiers of the Atlantic provinces, working together with universities to attract top talent from around the world. Kamal, you touched on this in your previous answer, but what, what does inclusion look like? What, what more needs to be done in a university setting on, on the front lines uh, on a day-to-day -day level, just so we're not taking uh, the diversity right. box, so to speak? Uh, uh, to me, it's, a lot, it's about a lot more than hiring or student recruitment. It's about looking at the curriculum, uh, the curricula in general, far more uh, critically. Uh, including, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, and, and I'm as guilty of that as any, as, every, uh, uh, as any other professor, I have a very home-based bias. So when I look at reading material and books and texts, I, I, never, I rarely look outside of the North American model. Um, it's slightly different in, for example, in, in, in literature departments. Uh, but um, so something that I've noticed uh, for students coming from India and Pakistan in particular is that there's, you know, there's a robust journalism tradition there. Um, and one of uh, something that my, the students who come uh, from those countries tell me is that print culture is thriving there. It is not, it's only here that we talk about the death of print. I mean, every day there are, in every, even small cities, they have multiple um, newspapers that they have to put out. Whereas we, for example, are phasing out print uh, classes. I mean, there's this kind of disconnect between, we do want the international students to come, uh, but we're not also, uh, we're not actually kind of accommodating because uh, you know, one hopes that some some of them will also want to go back to their home country and contribute to the economy. We talked already about the brain drain. Um, so it, it's to me, it's it's. I mean, there's nothing wrong with investing more, obviously, in hiring um, and student recruitment, but it is it goes it, it goes deeper into what are you asking students to do in a classroom? What are you asking them to read? What are you what are the the, the you know the sort of the Socratic method that, that is very much part of the North uh, the uh, the North American um, university model does that still work um, today? And obviously, I mean, you you mentioned the idea of uh, deference and and hierarchy. Um, I I I'm always uh, kind of amazed at um, at uh, uh, so students who come from different culture uh, different cultures then tend to be. Um, I don't want to say differential necessarily, but they're not like they're they're not taking full advantage of a critical culture, a, cu a culture that criticizes your professor, criticizes the way of thinking, that disagrees with your professor, and and in, you know raise their hands up and saying I think I think what you're saying is wrong or I have a different point of view. All of that we need to kind of and and the, the real challenge here is how to bring those quieter students, so the ones who don't necessarily want to challenge because they're, they're being trained in a tradition where the, you know, the teacher is a figure of authority. Um, so again, it's, a, it's, 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 it's about a lot more than hiring and recruitment. If I can pick up on this, and this is an area I've been interested in for decades. You know, I chose to go to Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario in the early 1980s because it offered an international program that was going to attract students from around the world. Now in those days, Peterborough was as white as white as white can be. And it was where product, uh, companies would do a focus group tests to figure out whether the market would, uh, uh, to do market tests. Now when you go to Peterborough, things have changed. Now not completely, and not as far as we'd like them to be. But that's an example of how communities do change and evolve over time. A more recent example is one from Nanaimo, where the Vancouver Island University attracts a number of international students and a number of First Nations students, actually amongst the highest in the country. And there the president talks about kitchen table diplomacy or kitchen table pluralism. Because in that community, international students have replaced the value of three mills that have closed. And the students stay with families around a kitchen table. And it, I mean, it's awfully simple, but the chance for families in Canada to get to know students as individuals, to get to know their families, uh, and to get to know shared hopes and dreams is something that is very, very powerful. And it's not just happening in Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. It's happening in Nanaimo, it's happening in Moncton, it's happening in Thunder Bay, it's happening in North Bay. 
and, and this is, these are some of the bright lights in terms of how we can uh, uh, make the pluralism experiment a pluralism reality for Canadians from coast to coast. How, how do you begin to change the culture in an organization when the advantage isn't obvious? And what I mean by that is, you know, if, if, in, just in my experience, if, if you're a broadcaster, it makes sense to have people of different backgrounds because those people connect with people watching. It can generate more revenue and it can have an economic gain. In banking, 300,000 immigrants uh, coming to Canada a year, if they all open RBC bank accounts, RBC is going to be pretty happy about that. Um, and so in sectors where there isn't that obvious advantage, and the, and the report mentions this, that it makes more sense in certain sectors than others to promote you know, inclusive hiring. Um, how do you get those people uh, on side when the economic advantage isn't obvious and in fact it can cost more to promote that type of inclusion? So, you know, I think if you really sort of step back um, and, and look at that, you're not going to find a lot of sectors where the business case isn't going to be there. Now, Paul talked about um, university campuses. They are very diverse today. You'd be hard pressed to find a sector that won't say my success is predicated on getting the best talent. Um, and I think the second part of that is it's not just about getting the best talent, but it's getting the best out of the talent that you have um, day in and, and day out. Um, so I guess I, you know, where um, as I think about your question, um, I, I'm not sure that you are you're going to get to to uh, uh, many sectors um, like that. Um, and so if you go back to diversities of fact, it really then becomes around what are you actually doing to ensure um, inclusion and to um, to to actually ensure because you you make a really good point on if you if you don't take actions around inclusion, diversity can actually be uh, you know can can have challenges uh, around it because if people don't feel like they're being fully utilized. Um, if people feel excluded, and we see that in societies, we see that in, in many societies that, you know, where, where they run into, um, where they have significant issues, um, it, it's, it, it can be a liability. And so it's not until you turn that diversity into, um, into value and when you're including people and everybody is a part of, of making the organization better, making the society better, that that diversity dividend comes through. You can't just sit back and say, tick, I've got a diverse workforce and the rest is going to take care of itself. Um, and, you know, I think at a very fundamental um, level, um, it, it really is, is about bringing out the best of, of everyone. I have two kids, and they are very different. What, what, what I, I think the one thing we haven't talked about, though, is that, you know, when we talk about diversity, we always talk about the differences. The way we define diversity at, at, at the bank is it's about our similarities and our differences. There are so many things that unify us as Canadians, as, as you know, we, we have this, many of those, the same shared values, we have the same dreams and hopes. And then it's about bringing the differences. Um, and back to, you know, starting the, the story of my children, they, we share common values as a family, but they are very different. They learn differently, they respond to things differently, but I am so invested in bringing the best out of them that I change the way that I interact with them, the way I listen to them, the, the way that I respond to them. And it's very much the same in a workforce. As a, as a manager or a leader, your, your role, your leverage, your impact doesn't come from you doing more work. It really comes from you bringing out the best of your people, and that means understanding them, understanding what makes them tick. What are the, the you know, what are some of those nuances, um, and how can you then take those actions to bring out, uh, you know, to to ask people for. We've heard a, a lot of the, the positive aspects of this. I want a dissenter who, who you know, who's going to be devil's advocate in the room so that you're actually bringing value to that different point of view. I, I mean, the thing that I noticed is that we are talking about <clears throat> professions and sectors that have been, I mean, the university, the bank, banking, 
the truth of the matter is that there are entire sectors that are dominated by diverse population, and these seem to be the low-paying, uh, labor-intensive sectors. So when you talk about, um, you know, taxi drivers, uh, people who work in supermarket checkout, um, if you've if you've had a blood test recently, um, and you've you've gone to uh, to uh, sort of uh, like a lab, you know a lot of them are from, uh, from, some of them are doctors who have retrained in order to get these jobs. They, um, elderly care, um, um, child care, for example, we have, in many ways, we have outsourced entire industries to diverse population because we pay them a lot less. And because they are, they, they in many ways, that this, I mean, this is the theme of my book, is that these diverse populations have become our working class. And we cannot have the system that we have in which we're all comfortable and we're doing well, except unless somebody else has to be paid a lot less. If we really value something like childcare, if you really think that your child, when you go to work, or you know, two, two working, um, two parents working and working who are working, deserves that someone at home um, needs to look after them and, and be really, um, then you need to pay them really well. And the reason you are paying for a Filipino maid to come is because you're paying her significantly below what a Canadian person would accept. So there are entire industries where, where actually the diversity has worked really well, but but not not necessarily in a kind of in an ethical or a moral um, narrative. If I, if I could jump in there, I happen to spend uh, most of today with a group of 35 grassroots organizations that work on access and success for marginalized communities, access and success to post-secondary education. And just to pick up on that in terms of how do you move a, a, a group or population from one standard of living to another in Canada, uh, we have more to do in this country. In the top four quintiles in Canada, uh, our post-secondary attainment is at or near the top in the world. For the bottom quintile, we're about 45th in the world. And, and not to get too far off, off the course today, but in one of the conversations, we were looking at all the different measures universities could take to improve uh, attraction and retention of, of marginalized communities. And one of the grassroots uh, providers of service said, the most important thing that can be provided is childcare. And so there is a holistic approach to the issues we need to address as a society. If I can go back to your point, Omar, about systemic change, because, uh, you know, look, I'm, I'm very proud of Canada's universities. We go around the world talking about our success and achievements, and there is a moment for Canada. But there's some issues which I really thought would be further along than we are right now. There's never been more than 22% of Canadian university presidents as women. Never more than 22%. Surely we can do better. And so we're taking action on that. And, and you know, that brings me to my last question because we've only got a few minutes left for this part of uh, the conversation. Uh, we, we've got the summary of recommendations. We, we know what the fixes are in terms of you know, recognizing foreign credentials, more inclusive hiring, putting an emphasis on these types of topics. Uh, immigration is certainly not a new phenomenon in Canada, and yet there seems to be a massive lag when it comes to action. In just a few minutes, I'm hoping to hear from each of you on, on why you think there is such a lag. So maybe I'll, I'll jump in. I think the, the way we need to work with this is in a is in really a multi-sectoral approach. We can't have government, academia, business, not-for-profits working in silos. These are, these are hard issues, but these are important issues. Uh, and who's going to bring us all together um, to, and, you know, we all need to take leadership, and I certainly, um, and, and business being part of it, but we can't solve we can't accelerate progress and accelerate. You, you started by saying there's urgency, and that to me translates to we don't have forever to, to really make significant progress. Um, this is a critical opportunity um, that we don't want to turn into an issue. And for me, the, ex the accelerator is finding new ways of working um, across those various sectors so that uh, because there is not a singular answer you need there's policy issues there's uh, there's uh, you know university and education related uh, there's business there's a lot of the services that go around it and uh, and I think that's the opportunity we need to find ways to to really um, advance um, to have um, impact and to scale the uh, the results um, 
I think I've, I'm going to answer you, to your, your in answer to your question. Um, in, in doing all the research I've done for the last four years on on, on very similar um, subject to this report. Um, we underestimate the effect of the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. Um, we really do, and I think, right, I mean, in many ways, we've come a long way in Canada, we've achieved a lot, but, you know, as you, all you know, rights can be won and rights can also be lost, and, and the clock can be turned back. Um, and I think when, when you talk about why is it still an issue, I'm gonna be blunt and say because politicians make it an issue when it's, when it's, when it's, when it's in their best interest to make it into a wedge issue, into an issue of, of them and us. And I, I also, I think, in, 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 in you know, sort of something that I've come to realize, um, I've lived in Canada for 21 years. Um, I am an immigrant, I came, although I came here with, with, uh, with, a, with a PhD in English. Um, and one of the, something I've, I've realized about Canada is that not all immigrants are created equal and not, or treated equal. Um, and there, there, are, there, there is a, at, at the moment we're just going through a moment of history, where speci you know specific groups, um, but, you know, in, in my opinion, they they happen to be brown, Muslim, particularly Muslim or North. Uh, the three largest, the fastest rising group, uh, ethnic groups in Canada are North African, South Asians, and Middle Eastern. And I think they're the three who are being, who are ex experiencing the most racism and and, and discrimination in the workforce. Um, and, I, and, and I do think that's in part because in some, in some political cir circles, it is really, it pays, it pays dividend to create them as not part of a cultural narrative of Canada. Yeah, let, let me just say that this report is so valuable because it's academically rigorous, it's evidence-based, and it's immensely practical. And the kind of conversations we're having tonight, I know are gonna take place right across the country. It's the kind of work the Global Center is so well positioned to do because it is about business, it is about academia, it is about civil society. Sure, taking a pride in our accomplishments, but then setting our ambition still higher. And I, I would just close with, with the, that sense of urgency that we have. We have a moment for Canada. Uh, the world is watching. And uh, we have an opportunity to build on some great strengths and to improve our performance right across the board. Now uh, is the time for the, the question and answer period, so we're happy to take your questions. And also, uh, if anybody's watching on the live stream and they want to tweet a question, we're also taking questions from uh, Twitter as well. We might get one from Donald Trump, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> They're all fired. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your kind words and great knowledge. Um, I'm a gender affairs consultant. And recently, I was at the Gender um, Equality Forum 2017 in Toronto, which was uh, co-organized and sponsored by uh, the Global Compact Canada, uh, Network Canada, and uh, UN uh, Global Compact Network. Um, one of the, the things that we, uh, when we were talking and discussing on the role of men, um, and boys, and, and um, surpassing that, that challenge of getting involved uh, with gender affairs. Um, there was a young youth that was from South Korea that was talking about the challenges that he had. And a lot of the challenges were from not, uh, from, were from home base uh, coming in the, in the um, foundation of the value systems in, that were based in the home. And we had an 80 year old who is into startups and, and an entrepreneur, but is facing an issue where she's saying, I'm a girl, how can I be doing STEM? How can I be expressing that? I'm wondering if anyone on the panel might be able to uh, maybe share some of the ideas that you in your um, backgrounds bring forth in, in um, supporting the eight-year-olds or the youth of the future in how they can embrace and uh, maybe even um, I think the big challenge in helping them in embracing their, their homes and, and sort of bringing that knowledge forward for their homes to be able to shift that. 
Um, sure. Uh, so there's um, there are a number of things. So I'll I'll maybe uh, um, comment on a couple. One of them is really you you talked about the role of men and and uh, and boys, and and I think that that is something we probably don't talk about enough or focus on enough. Um, when you when you look at women uh, in in particular that have been successful uh, professionally it is usually through the sponsorship and support of, of a senior male leader in the organization just because of the demographics. Um, but I would say that I am seeing more men get involved. I think that the other thing that is also not spoken about is the role of fathers. I actually think, um, when I look at my own experience certainly, um, fathers really from a very young age um, help you know, their, their influence on girls and what their daughters think they can be when they grow up is, is quite significant. Um, on the STEM side, I think it's a really good point, uh, just around how do you start girls very young to see that as, um, as a profession that they want to pursue. Um, and that's where I think certainly the, the role of fathers does, does come into play. But uh, one of the things we're doing is we have a we have programs called Kids Who Code. And so we have women, young women and, 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 and mature women like me, uh, going into schools and teaching kids how to code. And those kids include girls, um, and as well as kids from, uh, from marginalized communities, but really getting them to them early and the power of role models, women and girls as role models so that it's cool. Um, and uh, at, you know, at a, at a very early stage, and we probably need something much more systemic around on the on the STEM side, uh, because it's too late by the time they're they're you know in grade 11 looking to to go to university. Um, so it does, I think, it brings us back to the multi-sectoral approach around um, educators, um, around policymakers, as well as uh, businesses to get to girls much earlier on. Um, I, I guess I, I don't have that problem because um, um, I, I teach in a school that is 80% women, like the student population in School of Journalism is 80% women and 20% men. And in many ways, the, the male students, I know this is live streams, probably my, my <laughs> students will see it, the male students are probably are the underachievers, relatively speaking. Um, but I just want to just comment about the STEM thing and, and in, in relation to diversity and not just gender. Actually, the, the problem that I see is that uh, migrant communities, ethnic com communities, put so much emphasis on STEM, uh, they pu push their children to that as opposed to the humanities and the arts. And the problem that I'm seeing in, um, in our school is that there are a lot of students who would love to, to do an English degree or a history degree, but it's their parents who are telling them to go to STEM because you know, it's, it's the only right job for you is like an engineer or a doctor. Yeah, that's actually, that's a, I, I see the reverse problem in ethnic communities. That's a really interesting observation, and, and uh, certainly as a community, we see a, a need for more STEM, STEM students. We see a, more, a need for more uh, liberal arts and humanities students as well. And, and uh, the Canadian Council for Academies has done some interesting work about the need for both in an inclusive, innovative uh, Canada. I want to come back to your comment about the international uh, scene and, and just uh, give a shout out to a global campaign led by the UN called He for She, which is in its early stages, but it's nine universities around the world who are championing techniques to encourage uh, women in, in uh, leadership right across the university community and to increase the number of women in STEM. But to come to your question about uh, family values versus other values, um, Let's also be bold in saying that Canada's public education system is a pluralism asset, and it's one that we can never devalue. It's one that's at risk, frankly. Uh, I think we take great pride in that Canada has never had uh, a political party that was explicitly anti-immigrant. Unless we really work at pluralism in this country, we are at risk of falling in, a, in, a, in the direction of some other countries that have, have gone a, a very different way recently. Uh, well, 
airing uh, literary news in four languages, not only from Canada, but from all over the world. Now, I personally, if not the station, would be delighted to be um, in one way or another connected and related to the center and if there were a database. You know, I'm, of course, responding to invitation and demands by young writers, poets, and playwrights, and so forth, but there are so many <laughs> in the different parts of our wonderful country who uh, are looking for an outlet. I have once a week, half an hour, just at their disposal, but it's very difficult to, to discover them, to find them, you know? So my, my <laughs> modest request or suggestion would be that the center uh, works on uh, the establishment of a database for uh, cultural kind of resources, activities, and of course in my uh, interest of course literature, but it, it could be theater or film or so on. This would be very good. It's a good point, sir. I'm sure we can link you up with somebody after. Uh, oh, it would be nice if you could do that, yeah. Are there any more questions? Okay, we've got, oh, we've got one from Twitter, I think. Series. Um, we've taken a Mordecai Richler novel and turned the Jewish family into a mixed race family to demonstrate the fact that what, what he was talking about was the outsider trying to fit into a new society. We are all immigrants. I grew up as a young Jewish kid in Toronto, fifth generation, and I was told what I could not do. I could not belong to the Granite Club. I could not belong to the RCYC. I could not work for a chartered bank. My reaction to that was to make the world a place that was safe for everybody with excellence. So there is immediate change now. The hiring policies of broadcasters, the newspapers, uh, also the programming that they're trying to present. So I just wanted to give a happier note to that. <laughs> you can see why I work with Michael. <laughs> Champion pluralism and diversity, and, and really made it his life uh, made it his life's work. Michael, good good point. I want to get to a Twitter question, and then we'll come back to the floor. Great, thanks. Uh, so from our online community, we've had a question come in. Um, if producers and editors are the gatekeepers of traditional media, then uh, how can social media help us to challenge this and, and create greater pluralism? Um, and if this is the case, then how? That's a great question. I'm, I'm going to actually start with that, and then we can, uh, you know, get anybody who wants to weigh in on that. I think you can't you can't look at um, you can't look at media in, in in sectionalized ways or bifurcated ways. So, you know, when when we do TV, we do TV and have our eyes and ears on Twitter as well. And in faith, you know, a lot a, a lot of the times what leads on a national newscast will be drawn from who's tweeting about what. Arguably, <laughs> that can go either way. But I think the reason that's important is because th there's a consciousness increasingly that there's a huge voice out there from non-traditional outlets such as Twitter, and they are helping to shape what we see on television as well. And you're seeing a lot of cross-pollination. So I certainly don't want there to be a suggestion out there that, um, you know, Producers and, and presidents are there with the lock and key, and, and only they decide what goes on on television. Because I think again, it would be bad from a business perspective to live in silos like that. You can't make these decisions and not be conscious of what everybody else out there is talking about. I mean, that's what media is. It has to respond to what the conversations are in, in the public, and so that that is going out right now, and that is being challenged right now. So it's it's very much a of an active thing. Did you want to weigh in? Um, I, the only thing I would add is that while all of that is true, and, and, there's a, and social media has, has of, of course, changed the conversation entirely uh, on, on how news is consumed and how news is spread. I mean, I, 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 I 
get to find about breaking news bec um, on Twitter because I actually one of those people who doesn't watch cable um, like television on, on, on cable very much. Um, but you can't underestimate the role and influence of legacy media. We, we, I mean, this, this, we haven't made that transition completely where legacy media is unimportant. And the, 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 the interesting thing that you, that you would notice now in the post-Trump era is that subscription to, to the New York Times, to the Washington Post, to the Atlantic, to the New Yorker, to the Globe, and the Globe has had the whole campaign around around being you know uh, f you know facts and, and 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 that legacy media is still actually whether we, I mean, whether I mean we, there are a lot of uh, people sort of storming the barricades and want to tear down but the, the hardcore reporting is happening at, at legacy media and I still I, th I think it still has a, a huge influence on determining the covers and that legacy media still remains largely white Sorry, this one here. Hello. Uh, my name is Sheila James. I'm the Senior Strategic Advisor for Equity at the Canada Council for the Arts. And uh, recently, after a 60-year history of the institution, we've introduced um, diversity criterion in uh, our programs for core clients. So that's all of the artistic institutions and organizations that we fund. And so this has become a very important um, issue um, and subject for for these very influential institutions. So I was very interested in Kamal and what you were saying about the fact that in terms of content in magazines, there's very few um, uh, articles that are published that reflect the perspectives of minoritized communities. Mm. Um, and there's this big magnet conference in Toronto, which I'm speaking at, um, where we're going to wrestle with those things. Um, so I wanted to ask sort of a bigger question because we do hear this notion of um, diversity and inclusion, but we don't often talk about diversity and equity. And I think that is the heart of what we're talking about when we have these, you know, um, devalued sectors such as labor and childcare, et cetera, being filled with, with immigrants and people of color. And then other sec, oh, hello. <laughs> Other sectors um, having having such a a, um, a dearth of, of representation and perspective. So I just wanted to talk about why, you know, because inclusion um, inclusion assumes that there is a center that we then include others into. So I'm just wondering about equity. How how do you feel about that terminology and where is that? Uh, like equity in, in particular, um, equity, uh, equality. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a I'm a big believer in um, in affirmative action, for example, in in in, in things like quota um, uh, and all that stuff. But um, I'm not entirely sure, like what what, um, what what you mean exactly by equity here. But in in terms of magazine, like so, magazine or book publishing, which I'm sure you also this is the Canada Council for the Arts. Um, it's it's really about uh, people from certain communities, for example, know the stories of that community. You know there is more to that community. There is more to the Muslim community than suspicion of terror, for example. There is there is um, more to the to the Chinese community than the model minority um, narrative. And the reason we're not seeing these stories is because, again, I go back to the gatekeeper thing. Um, it's the editors that don't have the imagination to see beyond what they themselves consume in the media every day. It's a, it's a kind of, it becomes um, a, a self-perpetuating uh, prophecy in a, in a way. Um, I, would like to, I would like the Canada Council to take more action on, on placement of um, producers, the editors, um, the decision makers. I, mean, I think, I think what, what we're all talking about here is that is that, that div the diversity uh, model is not filtering up as much. And I think that's where the problem is. Because it, it's not about someone, someone on the job, but someone a, a, like an editor of a, of, of a publishing house can actually commission four or five books that put four or five young writers from those communities on the map. But at the moment, they're not, they're, they're not on the map because those editors are not even are not in place yet. Hi, thanks for uh, this really interesting discussion. 
I'd like to bring up uh, uh, an issue that hasn't been brought up so far. It's uh, in, in a way, Kamal uh, mentioned the issue of going backwards sometimes, uh, the issue of slippage. Because uh, we've been, in, in Canada, we've been dealing with the issue of uh, diversity training and multiculturalism and so on for the last 30 years or so. And we're very proud of our achievements, as we've been hearing in the media, in, uh, in banking sector, in um, universities, etc. I'll give you two examples as to how things uh, can go backwards. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, in uh, the local channel of CTV, the main one, uh, the leadership uh, insisted, well, you know, first the leadership had to be convinced about the issue of diversity, and when they were, they really took it to heart. Uh, and they formed an advisory committee and, uh, you know, made some progress in hiring people, uh, some stringers and so on, but you could see different kinds of faces on, on TV. Uh, I teach a course in, in media and race, and I showed my students the slide of the people the staff on that particular show now, the news show, and it's almost entirely white. So things can go backwards. I'll give you another example from my own department, my university. Uh, we were going to put together a video, uh, a recruitment video to encourage um, growth in our uh, graduate program. And uh, we received the funding late, and so it was summer, and uh, there weren't that many students around. So my director basically grabbed, you know, the, the four or five students who were around and was going to make, make, you know, basically put them in the video. And I saw the, the early rushes of the, of, the, of the clip, and I said, this is just not right because they're all white again. And how does this, what sort of a message is this going to send uh, not only to uh, our potential recruits, but to the world in general, because we're going to put it on our website. So, and, and this was a, a person, the director basically had written about issues of diversity uh, and uh, refugees and immigration and so on. So it's not that people, that training in itself is going to solve the problem. There seems to be a need for constant vigilance, for constant watching of where are we now and how are we falling back? I think um, this this market is um, an anomaly for, for a lot of broadcasters. I can't explain it. I don't. I don't. don't speak it. No, no. I, and I, <laughs> but I, I do think it's important to acknowledge some of the successes when you look at broadcasting generally. And what I mean by that is, you know, nationally, even growing up, I I don't remember um, seeing non-white broadcasters. I think there was Ian Hannah Mansing. Um, and that was it. You know, I remember calling him and saying, Ian, I want to talk to somebody who was very generous with his time. He spoke to me. Um, at this network, I've seen a cultural shift in the past five or ten years. In terms of the, the network correspondence we have, I, I would say there are three or four um, on the national news who are visible minorities. And so that there has been a shift. They're cognizant of, of, of that shift. And I think you need to look at it holistically. Is, is there work that needs to be done in certain markets? Absolutely. But I think if you look at other major markets, and I'm not just talking about CTV, Karim, you know, when, when you look at Vancouver or Ottawa or Montreal, uh, there's a big focus on making sure those reporters uh, reflect what we see in society. So I think your point is completely well taken. Uh, but I think on the national level, you are seeing a difference in faces. And when you look at the reach and the scope and, and who's watching that channel, these are audiences that are reaching, you know, these are audiences of hundreds of thousands of people, and in our case, a million plus. But your point is, is certainly uh, well taken. Are, are we seeing things going back? Is there a risk of things going back? I mean, I think you raise a, a really good point. Um, if you, you know, you, you will, it's very easy to slide back if you don't continually pay attention to this. And, and I talked earlier about our staffing goals for senior level positions. Every staffing matters. Um, and if we, in fact, about a decade ago, we, with women in particular, we thought, oh, we've arrived. We've got, you know, we've got great representation. It's going to happen naturally. Well, it wasn't. It didn't. And, and so having in place the, the rigor and the the right accountability metric. So for us, again, with our, with our staffing, we have, just like we have for other business reporting, just like we have you know, for financial, for client, um, we look at the, the 
on a regular basis, on a quarterly basis, we look at the staffing results by division. And we have a conversation around our uh, a senior uh, diversity leadership council chaired by the CEO that, and it's not about being punitive because when you have small numbers, it's very easy for, you know, you have five people, one person leaves and that person, you know, it's not a one for one replacement, but really um, having the institutionalized processes and practices is absolutely critical um, because it, it Otherwise, you can lose so, um, so much of, of, of what you've, uh, you know, the progress that you've made. Um, and, and again, I go back to, you know, it's not unique to diversity. I think with, with uh, many different objectives that we have, we have to stay on top of it. If I could jump in on that. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we've never exceeded more than 22% women as presidents of universities. This is despite the fact that boards of governors are actually uh, more gender diverse, more gender balanced than uh, in corporate sector boards. We're not quite at parity at the board level across the country on universities. But it is something where we're, we're ahead of some others. Uh, but in fact, we had a number of women presidents who were not successful in their presidencies for a variety of reasons. And that's made boards gun shy about hiring women. And so we've had to have a series of other conversations with boards of, of directors about promoting women throughout the university, not just in the presidencies, but right, right through the pipeline and ensuring that there's an adequate pool of uh, top candidates to consider. It's, to your point about sliding back, I think we're always at risk of sliding back unless we pay attention to this. And I think we do again have a, an opportunity now, uh, just because we're in Ottawa tonight, to reflect on, on the goals and messages of the current government by appointing a gender balanced cabinet, by making public appointments uh, a priority to reflect Canadian diversity. I think it's actually encouraging people in the private sector and people in civil society more broadly to say, this is a moment for Canada to step forward. Uh, again, the progress is not complete, it's, it's uneven, uh, but I'm hopeful that conversations like this and work like this will help us refocus and reframe the discussion for practical action. Paul, have you had men presidents who haven't been successful? Yeah. <laughs> I, absolutely. No, I, uh, we're on the same page. We're on the same page there, but that's never, you know, that's not a common, oh, he wasn't successful because he's a man. You're absolutely right. Um, you mentioned about how diverse the universities are now in Canada and how pluralistic the universities are right now. Congratulations on that, but I think this happened by the forces of nature where it was due to immigration and due to the people coming into the country that actually changed the way things are happening today. My question is, if I was a, a student with excellent credentials and I got an admission in four universities, everything being equal, and I'm looking for diversity and inclusiveness. Would you be able to offer me something different than another university where you would have the cutting edge so that I could decide to go to your university? Do you foresee any kind of this type of situation in the future? Yes, and, and again, we're, we're fortunate in the country to have uh, excellent universities, and when people ask me for advice about where should their, their son or daughter go, I say, really, it's all about feel and fit. It's all about feel and fit. Maybe it's a small, immersive undergraduate university that you're looking for. Maybe it's a globally competitive, research-intensive university in a large urban center. Young people have an appetite to explore the world, and we want to encourage the students to, use, to get as much information as possible about the different offerings of universities. Because universities are different. They're, they're of uniformly high standard, but they offer different kinds of experiences. And so that, that is actually a value proposition that some universities are making, that come to this campus and you will have a global experience in Canada. Come to this campus and you'll be recognized and welcomed uh, as, a, as, a, as a Canadian or as an international student. In fact, one of, our, one of our most successful marketing features to international students is come to Canada and you won't be recognized as a foreigner. Uh, because in other parts of the world, people do not receive the safe, secure, and welcome uh, uh, 
welcome reception that they do here in Canada. Thank you very much. Um, we've been, we're part of a group that's, that's uh, trying to assess and accredit peace professionals. And one of the difficulties is that from the outside, that profession is seen as a do-gooder rather than a serious profession. And we've been thinking of doing a business case for peace, a very serious global business case for peace. And it strikes me that what you've done um, you've overcome a hurdle that we would face, which is how do you take something relatively ephemeral and turn it into relatively hard statistical verification? And having done that, um, I think the, the challenge now, as you've said, is how to, to get that product into the public eye and I'm, j I'm just thinking out loud here, which is a bit embarrassing in front of a lot of people, but, but um, there's an organization, for example, um, CATA, are you familiar with CATA, C-A-T-A? The Canadian um, Advanced Technology Alliance. And they specialize in, in sort of the technical highway of information and are extraordinarily linked throughout Canada and into the business world and into the, the sort of the technical side of the, of the social media. And I'm just wondering whether you could somehow piggyback on groups like that to publicize the statistical evidence that you seem to present for making a case of dividends for pluralism. I don't know if anything I've said makes sense. Refer to the authors here. And I, and I just want to wrap up. Uh, we're all self-selected in this room. You know, we've, we've showed up here because we believe in this, and we, we're talking about it, we're discussing it, and obviously there needs to be significant work in trying to win over those who do not believe in this to the same degree. Even though, as, as we're seeing from the analysis, there is a strong business case for this. I'd just like to wrap up, um, have each of you weigh in on how do you do that? How do you start, you know, winning others over and, and bringing them on side? It's a big question. Yeah. It, it is, and, and uh, you know, there is there. I mean, there's there isn't a silver bullet, but it is about everyone taking responsibility for doing that. Um, you know, we talked about, or I talked about this multi-sectoral and 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 the leaders, and I certainly see that business leaders um, have a critical role to play here because people listen to to business leaders, and it's certainly something. Um, you know, in, in our organization where we've had um, our, our previous and current CEO talk a lot about this. And today, the, the context is around growth and innovation uh, because people listen. Um, and it's about speaking up. It's about speaking out. Um, it's about making the case. But it's also, you know, what I don't think we've talked about is it's clearly the smart thing to do, but it's also the right thing to do. Canadian values are uh, very much based on equity, on fairness, on respect. It's what's made us uh, uh, successful as a nation. It's, it has been, in, in my view, um, you know, really critical. And we shouldn't forget that this is also about living our values. And, and the thing, in, you know, from a business point of view, when you do the right thing, it actually is the smart thing. We're a business of trust. And when we are values-based and live out our values, clients want to do business with us. People want to work for us. And so you do get the dividend um, at, at the other end. Uh, and what I would leave groups like this, though, yes, we are all the converted, but you can all make a difference. You have, you have your own networks. You, uh, you have... Um, people that you can influence and I think 
you know, taking this material here, leveraging what's, what's here already, people that you know, start to have these conversations in your workplaces, in your circles, um, to, to really try to get that leverage. Speak to your politicians. Um, you know, what are your point, Paul, about this being our moment? Um, show an interest with your politicians around the importance of this and the opportunity. Um, and I think collectively, really mobilizing people can um, can maybe be one of the accelerants for us. So how do you make sure that the report doesn't collect dust and, and that the organizations are, are action? I'm going to say something that is going to put Paul on the spot a little bit. Um, and I'm going to say the way I do it is that I, I, I try to leave the ivory towers of academia and try as much as possible to do work that is accessible and it's targeting uh, like a mainstream audience in in a legacy media in legacy media or or on, on new media and just not not just being stuck in the peer review uh, I mean uh, best man and I were just talking about this uh, and, and I'm going to quote you on this most academic articles are not read by more than 15 people at, at any given time and uh, and I think, uh, and this is what, what is great about this report, is that it has the academic rigor, but it has a narrative, it has a story. And I think Canadian universities need to, I mean, I, I'm lucky that I worked in Ryerson, and that, that, is, that, is, that is the model that Ryerson already has. A lot of my, the creative work I do goes towards my, has gone towards my tenure, will go towards my promotion. But so many Canadian universities are stuck in this peer review that is soul destroying in many ways and does not, this is publicly funded research. It needs to go back to the public. Yeah, I don't think we're going to have. I don't think we're. Gonna, I don't think we're actually going to be that much more on the spot. Uh, yeah. One of the initiatives you should watch for, everyone should watch for later this spring, is a Canadian launch of the conversation. I don't know if people know the globalconversation.com, but it's yes. coming to Canada. It'll be an opportunity for Canadian academics to, to communicate directly with the public. There are 400 Canadian academics writing for it now globally. It's coming to Canada as another way of reaching out to everyday Canadians uh, about the work that to the Canadian Academy does. But to come to your question, Omar, I've been struggling over the last several weeks, but how do we f walk that fine line between Canadian humility, we're not as good as we think we are, we should really just keep our head down, and being proud and boastful of the accomplishments that we've made. And walking that fine line as well about being too smug or too complacent. And so I, I invite people when they think about pluralism, yes, think about Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver, but think about Nanaimo, think about Thunder Bay, think about Moncton. And the other piece, we've talked about how do we bring our message to those communities. How do we listen to those communities? And how do we find voices and champions in those communities that say, yeah, this reflects our lived reality too. And I think it's a great opportunity for everyone in this room, as you have your networks across the country, to consider how the pluralism message, how the work of this report, rigorous evidence-based academic work combined with practical suggestions can be brought into the everyday life of Canadians in communities right across the country. Excellent points. I'd like to thank all three of you and Jillian and Vesmo for an Take amazing this report. Uh, to all of you for coming here and to John for uh, hosting us obviously today. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm sure you guys will be here for uh, a little bit. Feel free to chat, but uh, otherwise have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. First of all, thank you to, um, to Omar and to all of our panelists for a very stimulating discussion and to all of our participants here for generating uh, such an interesting conversation and I know both Basma and I look forward to following up. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank um, our supporters and partners without whom uh, this project would not have been possible. First of all, of course, the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation who uh, really uh, was the inspiration for the, the work that we've done and have supported us uh, right through this, uh, this journey. Um, I would also like to um, thank the Panacaro Foundation for their generous, very generous funding and support of our project, um, uh, the RBC Royal Bank, uh, who have partnered with us along the way and provided us with um, advice and I think sometimes, you know, questioned where we were going and forced us to, to think about um, what else we could do uh, with this project, and last of all, to the uh, Global uh, Center for Pluralism, uh, who supported us and hosted us tonight, and, and again supported us throughout uh, this enterprise. So, um, thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. 
And, and I'm just going to thank you all for coming tonight and hope to see you back at the Global Center for Pluralism. Um, <clears throat> we've been extremely fortunate uh, to have such a, a stimulating and probing discussion from our panelists. And so a big thank you. I echo the thanks that, that uh, Omar and Jill expressed. Uh, and I, I think that the thoughtfulness of the discussion is only matched by the substantiveness of the report. And it's our hope that it gets real traction. And the, the, the fact that it comes to some very practical recommendations is just what I think is, is needed. Um, a last word. Um, many of you have been kind enough to compliment uh, the center on our, our building, on the renovation of this historic building. Come, uh, come June, uh, if you would like to rent our signature spaces, this room, <laughs> it's all available to rent. And that's, that. to be very honest, it's partly to generate revenues, because it's an expensive place to heat and light and so on. But it's also to bring people in and for them to get to know what this place is all about. So just to say that we, we're delighted to hear from you and your organizations come June. So thank you very much again for being with us.